Well, good morning, and we welcome you again. We welcome you to worship this morning. It's great to be together with you here in Graham Chapel and with you that are watching on the live stream. Um, we had a memorial service in here on Saturday, and I wasn't able to be at the memorial service, but I was able to watch it uh, online. And what a blessing that is to be able to see the service from wherever it is that you are in Black Mountain or Montreat or Swanoe Valley or throughout the world and, and to join us here as we worship our King. Um, what a great gift that is. And thank you, media team, um, who are working behind the scenes to make this happen. We really appreciate all that you're doing. But we're, we're grateful uh, to be with you here in Graham Chapel. I wanted to tell you just about a couple of things that are coming up. Um, this afternoon, uh, we've been praying that the Lord would open up uh, a beautiful day for us to be able to gather outside and sing. And so uh, today we're going to celebrate our Christmas cantata with uh, some members of the choir outside on the, um, on the platform out there. Uh, we've got a beautiful big deck out there that we can spread out and sing. And we're going to enjoy uh, being able to sing, uh, celebrate. Uh, it's, it's called a celebration of carols. So all the familiar ones that you know, come bring a chair or, or stand. It won't be very long. It'll be about 30 or 40 minutes long. But it'll be a great chance to, um, to hear these songs of Christmas that our hearts long to sing and to hear. So join us for that. Also, uh, during uh, Christmas this week, we have some special services planned um, both online um, and, uh, and live on Christmas Eve, actually. We're going to do something that I don't think we've ever done before. Maybe we have before I was here. We're going to gather around Lake Susan on Christmas Eve at 515, and we're going to do a Christmas Eve candlelight service around the lake here in Montreat. And so we invite you to come, bring your masks, come out, and we'll have candles for you, and we'll gather around the lake and hear the word of God, sing some uh, awesome carols, and as the sun goes down and becomes night, we'll light our candles, sing Silent Night, and celebrate around the lake, and it will be a real, um, a real uh, treat. So we hope the weather holds for that, and you're able to come out for, for, with us on the 24th of December for that. Um, this morning, we want to invite one of our families who are watching at home, the Jones family. Uh, the Jones family are going to share with us the call to worship. And as they um, enter into the call to worship, I'll invite you to stand and join in the response this morning. So here is the Jones family. Thank you for helping us light the candles this morning. Welcome, Christ Community Church, to the third Sunday in Advent. God is faithful in sending the light of his salvation into our darkness and the comfort of his grace into our wilderness. He has done this by sending his son, Jesus Christ. As we light this third candle, we remember that we are a people of hope. Though there may be barren places in our lives, and we wonder if God hears our prayers and works in our lives, the Christmas story reminds us that he does. God hears our prayers, and he, his answers accomplish his purposes for our good and his glory. Our call to worship this morning is from Zechariah's song in us? Luke 1. Zechariah was the father of John the Baptist, who was born to him and his wife Elizabeth long after they had any earthly hope of having children. But God had other plans. Praise be to the Lord, for he has come and has redeemed his people. Salvation, Salvation from, from our enemies, enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Who hate us. To show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. And to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him in all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way for him. To give his people the knowledge of salvation through the, through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven. To shine on those living in darkness, and in the, the shadow, shadow of death, death to guide our to feet, guide our feet into, the into the path of peace. Let us adore him.
have our praise and our worship and our devotion this morning once again as we gather as your people to honor you, to proclaim your name over all the nations. From our own community to the ends of the world, you are sovereign and you have come down and we worship you not as the baby that was born only, but also as the king who reigns. We know the whole story, that you have gone to the cross and borne our sin, and that you have been raised from the dead to give us new life, and that you are coming back again. And we wait in this Advent with anticipation for when we will see you face to face. But this morning, Lord, would you quicken our hearts by your Holy Spirit to bring you the honor due your name, for we are your people, and we love to worship you. We join our voices now, Lord, as one in the prayer that your Son taught us, saying, Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Come Christians all rejoice. Christ was born to save. This is our Redeemer, born to save. Let's sing the hymn this morning. Christians all rejoice. Reply. Christ, so that we may shout out the birth of our King this morning. Let's sing together the first note. With one voice we gather, with one voice we sing of a King who is mighty and has done great things. The first Noel the angel did sing was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay. 
King of Israel. Let's pray to the Father. Join me, please. We bow before you humbly and boldly to proclaim your name is holy. The Advent season allows Christ's followers to embrace the power of a baby born to become the King of Kings. Our hearts ache for more. Oh God, more peace, more joy, more hope more of you. We worship you today as your chosen ones, fallen yet forgiven, forever grateful for your love. God, we lift up the youth and children of our membership. We ask that you embolden them in their faith in Christ's service. Help us to lead them to know you in a deep way. May the adults in their lives model the love of Jesus. And God, forgive us when we fail, when we fail ourselves, each other, and most of all, when we fail you. God, we need you. Many of our church family are hurting. We pray for the Beth Brayboy family in her home going. We lift up Charlie Lance, who has prostate surgery tomorrow. We think of Richard Fernandez in hospice. We lift up him and Cheryl as she cares for him. As each day passes, some of us come closer to COVID-19. 
heal those afflicted by this pandemic illness and its effects. Some among us need work, transportation, housing. Some need friendship. The leadership of Christ's community need wisdom as we pray, prepare, and plan for ministry in 2021. Thank you for the faithful support of our brothers and sisters in this body, support of prayer, volunteering, finances, care for others, loving their neighbors as themselves. And God, we lift up our community in great need, especially as we enter these long winter months. Swannanoa Valley Christian Ministry, Bounty and Soul, Williams Place, the Backpack Program, Montreat College. Collectively, these organizations reach hundreds, maybe thousands, and the impact is far and wide. God, we pray for the clients who receive the love of Christ through these, our partners. Our nation is reeling from the pandemic and its destructive path, and we pray for our country, our county, our national leaders who daily make decisions that affect us all. God, we want to lift up Christian and Kay Zebley in Japan and ask you to bless their online worship. Use the Zebleys to lead students to Jesus through their Intro to Christianity classes. Provide students with curiosity. We lift up Sam and Katie Barker in Birmingham, UK. We praise you for the two students that the Barkers led to Christ. Thank you, God. God, help the Barkers to make the connections to share the gospel. We lift in prayer all the missionaries this church supports financially that they sense your presence and power as they present their bodies as living sacrifices. O oh Lord, your kingdom come, thy will be done as we yield to your good and perfect will today. We ask your blessing on Pastor Richard as he opens your word. In Jesus' name I pray. And I'd like to invite you to uh, give uh, today, to thank you for the opportunity for giving uh, on your screen. You see text to give. It's actually really easy. And uh, for those of you that are present, there's a box in the back in the foyer if you'd like to drop off your gift. And uh, thank you for your generous giving this year. What a blessing.
these weeks before Christmas, let's join Isaiah, Zechariah, Joseph, and Mary and ponder afresh how Jesus Christ came into our night with light, comfort, hope, and life. There will be no more gloom for her who is in anguish. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Arise, shine, for your light has come. list of some things that we typically associate with Christmas, um, and yet there's one thing in each of these lists that doesn't quite fit, okay? Doesn't fit with the others, what we would associate with Christmas. So which of these does not fit, okay? Here's list one. Turkey carving, carol singing, mistletoe kissing, kneeling in prayer. Uh, probably kneeling in prayer. You know, uh, that's not the, didn't really go with the others. Uh, list two, gift wrapping, tree trimming, card writing, prayer meeting, which doesn't fit. <laughs> prayer meeting, okay. Three, uh, shopping list, Christmas gift list, Santa's list, prayer list, which doesn't fit, you know. Ah, prayer list, you know. Okay, let's change it up. Let's do some songs of the season, okay? Which of these songs doesn't fit, uh, at least as you associate with Christmas? Uh, I'll be home for Christmas. Two, have yourself a merry little Christmas. Three, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Or four, God is answering my prayers at Christmas, which doesn't fit. <laughs> Well, it's prayer with all of them, isn't it? Now, you might be crying out, that's not fair. You know, we pray at Christmas. True, but prayer and, and answered prayer is most likely not, you know, in the top 10 things that we automatically associate with Christmas, but perhaps it should be. You know, Christmas and Advent is, is all about longing and, and prayers long prayed. One of the cries of Advent is, is how long, O Lord? Advent reminds us that we live in barrenness, we live in need and emptiness. How long, O Lord? Between the end of the Old Testament, Malachi, and the coming of Jesus, there was a period uh, of 400 years, and it was basically a silent period where there was no prophetic word from heaven. How long, O Lord, till you speak again? Daily inside the temple, priests would offer incense uh, these, this was on behalf of the people as, as prayer offered to the Lord, asking God to save them. Well, how long, O oh Lord, until you come and, and answer and save us? Well, it's to one of these praying priests that God does answer. Let's look at this from Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, of the division of Abijah. He had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord, but they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, According to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Zechariah was troubled when he saw him and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for behold, your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. He must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. 
Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I'm an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. The angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. Behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. The people were waiting for Zechariah. They were wondering at his delay in the temple. When he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. He kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And for five months, she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Well, Advent is a time of, of waiting on the Lord and there's all these unanswered prayers scattered all around on the floor of our lives. And we're, we're asking, I mean, we're even doing this waiting for the return of Jesus. How long, O Lord? Well, unanswered prayer is where we initially meet Zechariah uh, and Elizabeth. Twice a year, pre, as a priest, Zechariah would go up to Jerusalem uh, to assist at the temple to help out with people who are making their sacrifices uh, and uh, Chosen by lot, uh, uh, you know, certain number of priests were able to go inside the temple and, and offer the incense at the prayer at the time of prayer. Well, it was a great job to have. Uh, what a privilege! But there's a huge hole in Zechariah and Elizabeth's hearts because they're childless and now they're old. Now, not being able to have children uh, in our day, it's a deep sadness, isn't it? But it's not a disgrace. Yet it was in their day. Now Luke makes clear, Zechariah and Elizabeth, they're, they're good people. They're, they're blameless observers of God's law. That doesn't mean they're perfect, but they're faithful. You see, beyond mere ritualistic checking off of some spiritual box, you know, God was alive to them. They loved him and they lived to honor him. But in their day, the thinking, the common thinking was that barrenness was a curse, a curse of God. It was an indicator that you were not righteous. And so for years, they just, they just lived under this cloud of suspicion of people probably talking behind their backs about, oh, there must be some hidden sin in their lives. God's punishing them for something. Now, that was not true. But that was the cloud they lived under. And so when Elizabeth does get pregnant, you know, what, what's, what's the first thing out of her mouth? It's, it's verse 5. It's kind of her vindication. God has looked on me to take away my reproach among people. What are the unanswered prayers in your life today? Some of you, some of us, may be walking around uh, under a cloud of shame. Perhaps we feel like others are looking down on us. Maybe we look down on ourselves. Life hasn't turned out the way we wanted, even as we've prayed. Instead of this life here that we wanted, uh, there's a sad loss, there's a, an aching lack, maybe there's a setback, and, and life just seems to mock us. Well, Advent and Christmas remind us with, with gracious force God hears and answers our prayers. Gabriel says to Zechariah, verse 13, your prayers have been heard. God hears the prayers of the barren who cry to him, and he takes away their disgrace. This is, this is one of the first things we learn uh, from this passage here, one of these Advent, great Advent texts. But notice, secondly, the timing of God's answers that they, they don't always cooperate or, or operate according to our time scale, but they always seem to operate and they function perfectly with the fulfillment of God's promises. You know, Zechariah is chosen to go inside the temple and offer incense 
on behalf of the people who are standing outside. Now, this, this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Uh, it, as a priest, you go up there twice a year, but only one time in your life can you be chosen by lot to go into the, inside the temple. And Zechariah is chosen. I mean, this is his big day. I'm sure he's thinking, I can't wait to get home and tell Elizabeth. Well, when he's inside, you know, suddenly an angel appears, Gabriel, and Zechariah's terrified. Gabriel assures him, hey, there's no need to, to be frightened. And then he announces the good news. God has heard your prayer. Now stop right there. What prayer? You know, Zechariah was not at this moment praying for a son. Truth be told, he and Elizabeth probably had given up on that prayer long ago. I mean, age and barrenness had, had stamped a you know, big no across that request, or so he thought. The prayer that Zechariah was offering in this moment was for Israel. It was a prayer based on the, on the promises of God, a prayer for God's peace to come on his people. Uh, you know, some of the last uh, words of the Old Testament, uh, which would have been his Bible, uh, Zechariah's Bible, but Malachi chapter 3 and 4, you know, it, it, the Bible ends there with a, a, on a cliffhanger note. You know, there are all these promises of God that are just hanging out there. It's like, when can we grab hold of these? When are you going to you know, bring about these promises? The prophetic era seemed to have stopped in great anticipation of the promises coming. You know, when will they come? Listen to some of these promises from Malachi 3 and 4. Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. He will purify the sons of Levi. Behold, the day is coming for you who fear my name. The son of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. You should go out leaping like calves from the stall. I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Zechariah's prayers were in line with these promises of God. O oh Lord, send Elijah. O oh Lord, purify your people. O oh Lord, turn the hearts of your people back to you and back to one another beginning in our homes. O oh Lord, let the sun of righteousness shine on your people. Heal us from this disgrace of our sin and bondage. Well, that is exactly the prayer God answers. And he also answers Zechariah's prayer for a son. John is the answer, at least part of the answer to, to these long prayed for promises of God. And if there's any doubt, I mean, notice how Gabriel weaves this all together. I mean, Gabriel is quoting Malachi as he talks of John, verse, verse 16, he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will go before him in the spirit of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Zechariah and Elizabeth will get a son and the nation's going to get the promised Elijah the prophet. Zechariah and Elizabeth are going to get a child running around the house and the nation, it's going to get the promised messenger running ahead of the Lord, preparing his way. Zechariah and Elizabeth, they're going to, they're going to hear the cries and the, and the laughter of little John, and their hearts are going to be all turned toward that little guy. Oh, there's going to be such joy and delight. And the nation is going to hear the promised message that turns the hearts of the fathers to children and children to fathers. Part of the, of the seeming delay of God's answers to our prayers may be that he is, He's weaving together our answers into the, into the fabric of the larger works based on His promises. One of my favorite all-time stories uh, is, is about the Jesus Film Project. Um, I don't know how many years they've been showing this film around the world, 30 plus years, I suppose, at this point. Um, and their aim is, is that everybody in the world would see this film about Jesus in, in his or her own language. 
And of course, millions of people have come to Christ through, uh, through watching this film and, and the follow-up behind that. Uh, well, in the 1990s, a team was traveling through Russia. And their method was to show the film, invite people to trust Christ, and then to, to give out Bibles, to, you know, free uh, Bibles for folks. Well, in this particular city they, that they were about to show the film, they realized they didn't have very many Bibles at all to hand out. Well, a leader in that city who was part of the, of the team, the Jesus Film, people, uh, film team, um, he re- remembered, ah, when Stalin purged the city of Christians, he confiscated their Bibles, but he didn't burn them. You know, that was a miracle. Instead, he boxed the Bibles up and had them put in a warehouse. Well, the Jesus Film people went to the mayor of the town and got permission to get those Bibles out of storage and to give them away. But they had to hire a, a number of, of people to, uh, to go into the warehouse, you know, get the Bibles out of the large boxes and put them in small boxes and then put them on the truck for transportation. Well, one of the young men that they hired was this hardened, cynical unbeliever. He didn't believe in God, but he needed money. <laughs> so... Uh, he, uh, he came to help out. Well, as he was handling hundreds of Bibles, it did not cross his mind to ask for one. He just went ahead and stole one. <laughs> well, at the end of the day, when all the Bibles had been loaded and the Jesus film people started paying the workers, uh, some of the workers noticed that their hard, cynical, unbelieving friend wasn't there to get his paycheck. They wanted, where is he? So they started looking through the warehouse for him. And they found him hiding behind some boxes, pouring over a Bible. The Bible he had stolen, and tears were just streaming down his face. And it just so happened. (laughs) The one Bible, out of all those thousands of Bibles in that warehouse, the one Bible he had stolen When he opened the cover, the handwritten signature was that of his own grandmother. And it was his grandmother's Bible that then opened his heart, softened his heart, and and he was led to Christ. You know, God answered the prayers of the Jesus film people, didn't he? We need more Bibles. And God answered the prayers, and dare I say, long forgotten prayers of a grandmother who no doubt had prayed for her family years and four years, and but years before. And all of this is woven together by God. That's how He works so often. His seeming delays to our prayers are not callous indifference. God is not deaf to, uh, to our prayers or uncaring uh, with those areas of our life that there's need, there's barrenness. He hears and He answers. See, this is what Advent and Christmas underscore. These, these long-forgotten prayers, they're powerful. God hasn't forgotten them. And they come meeting us in the present as God works His purposes out in accordance with His promises. So pray, don't give up. Well, back to Zechariah in the temple here. He's just heard this tremendous news from the angel. Uh, You know, you and Elizabeth are going to have a son. And we'd expect Zechariah, you know, to be doing the happy dance, you know, do-si-do with Gabriel right there in the temple. But no, um, there's not a happy ending on this story. The the sad uh, reality of unbelief rears its ugly head instead. Gabriel doesn't believe God's word through... uh, Zechariah doesn't believe Gabriel's word. Uh, he doubts it. He's, he basically says, yeah, how's this going to be? I mean, you can just see him with his arms crossed. How's this going to be? You know, what, what, what's the most outlandish thing that an angel could say to you today? Well, this was it in Zechariah's life. You know, in case you haven't noticed, Gabriel, you know, maybe it's a little dark in here for you, but I'm old. <laughs> My wife's advanced in years. Everywhere we go, we qualify for AARP discounts, you know. This just isn't happening. 
I don't think that Zechariah's unbelief was some studied thing as if he'd woken up that morning thinking, you know, if an angel speaks to me today, I'm not believing it. No, his, his unbelief is more a reactive unbelief that comes from the wound of disappointment. I mean, how many years had Elizabeth cried herself to sleep over her barrenness? At the place in her life, the one place where she was supposed to be fruitful and fulfilled, she was completely empty. How many years had Zechariah had to pick his wife up emotionally and assure her that he was not disappointed in her? He was not wishing he had another wife instead of her. At this point, when Gabriel gives the good news, well, it's all, you know, too old, too late, too broken, too far gone in Zechariah's mind. Ironically, Zechariah's name means Yahweh remembers. But Zechariah is living as if Yahweh has forgotten. See, the room he's, he's living in now is no wider than Elizabeth's barrenness. And there's just no room for God in this thing. Now, here's the reason why some of us really struggle with the good news, the good news that God loves us. It's the wound of disappointment. Someone, something, some unanswered prayer or maybe a lot of things we've prayed for just haven't come about. That's shut us in and shut God out. Zechariah, you know, no doubt trying to, you know, somehow justify his position and said, well, you know, you you just gotta be a practical realist at times. Some things just are not going to happen. Circumstances prohibit them. But God is not a practical realist. God is able to call into existence things that do not exist. He's able to bring life from what is dead. Now certainly Zechariah knew this. I mean, all the stories of the Old Testament... God breaking through when, when things seem broken and, and, and dead. And why, why is it that he didn't put his faith into this larger picture of the larger God? Well, forget Zechariah. <laughs> what about you and me? You know, what looms larger? Our circumstances, our unanswered prayers, or the Lord? Well, let's get back to Zechariah here and Gabriel. Um, yeah, I, the one I feel sorry for in this story is Gabriel. Um, <laughs> I mean, he's expecting Zechariah to celebrate, but instead Gabriel gets dissed by this priest. You know, his word is questioned. How shall I know this? Well, what more do you need, Zechariah? Another angel? I'm Gabriel. I stand in God's presence. God wasn't wasting his time when he sent me. I'm not wasting my time by coming, so don't waste my time with that question, you bozo. You want a sign? Okay, you're going to be the sign. And Zechariah loses his ability to speak for nine months. He may also have lost his ability to hear. Because when John is born and, and the people you know, want to question Zechariah, hey, what do, we, what do you want to name the child? They didn't ask, as if you could hear. Verse 62 says they had to make signs. You know? what, what, what do you want to call the you know, baby that's been born? Too old, too late, too broken, too far gone? Not for God. Christmas calls us to, to open the window and and the doors of that narrow room of unbelief. God is among us. He hears and answers prayers, and nothing is going to stop him from fulfilling his promises. Interesting, this is what the angel Gabriel says later, six months later, to Mary, for nothing is impossible with God. Well, let's not leave Zechariah hanging out there looking like the total failure. (laughs) Um, how does he break out of this narrow room of unbelief? 
How, how does he do it? Well, it's by two things. And the first is obedience. He hears the word of Gabriel. Your wife's, you and your wife are going to have a baby. So Zechariah has to go home. And without words, explain to his wife, we need to get pregnant. And we're going to get pregnant. <laughs> now, I don't want to go PG-13 on us here, but he has to move toward his wife. He says he's old and she's old. Is desire there? Is ability gone? I mean, we, we don't know these things. But he is going to have to move with obedience to God's word toward his wife. And what I love about this is, you know, when we think about, you know, obey, obey God and God calls us to obey. We think, okay, yeah, what do you want me to do? You know, bring you the broomstick of the wicked witch of the West? You know, no, the obedience of God starts right in our homes. It's in the daily stuff of life. That's where our obedience to the Lord is, is hammered out, really where it begins. And so Zechariah obeys the word of God through the angel. He moves toward his wife. The second thing that he does is he soaks himself in Scripture. He just soaks his soul in, in God's word. Um, you know, when, uh, when John is finally born, Zechariah's tongue is freed up. And the first thing he does is he breaks out into this prophetic praise of God. And we, uh, this was actually our call to worship from verses uh, 68 through 79. But if you read back through that Zechariah song, there's something like over 25 scripture references. This man went back and just got into, into, into God's word. He started remembering all these promises of God. And this is then what, what spills out of him. I mean, he bleeds Bible, as it were. Well, what's he doing there? He's recalibrating his faith on the basis of the promises of God. What has God said? He is going to do. Here's how we break out of the, that room of unbelief. It's through obedience and building our faith on the promises of God. Scripture, soaking in Scripture. I love what uh, Zechariah says of uh, part of his song. He speaks of, of his son John. This is verses 76 to 79. And you, child, will go before the Lord to give knowledge of salvation to his people, the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. What is that? It's all Scripture. It's all promises of God. Obedience and standing, believing, put in our hope in God's Word. This is how we break out of the narrow room of unbelief. Well, what do you associate with Christmas? Let it be prayer. God answering prayer. We, we need a song. I see Chris coming in. I charged him first service. Chris, we need a song about God answering our prayers at Christmas. <laughs> because he does. His aim is to set us free from shame and barrenness of sin and death. He does so through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the sunrise who's visited us from on high. He's here. He's present in our circumstances. He's present to our prayers. And so if you are stuck today in unbelief because of, of unanswered prayer or you're, you're stuck in some wound of disappointment, feeling too old, too late, too far gone, too barren, turn to the Lord. Trust the Lord. Keep praying. Because God will answer in time in line with his promises. And Zechariah's word about John is a word for us to be fulfilled in us through Jesus. The sunrise will come to us from heaven to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. What darkness, what, what shadow is over your life right now? Where do you need to be guided? Jesus, the sunrise has come. He's here. Hope in him with your prayers. Amen.
Richard asked us a question in his message. He said, what is the most outlandish thing that an angel would say to you? <laughs> and, and friends, this morning, we don't have an angel that says this to us, but we have in Jesus Christ, in human flesh, the very Son of God saying to us, your sin is forgiven. That is outlandish and beautiful. If you don't know Christ, we invite you this day to make him the Lord of all. The Lord of your heart, the Lord of the universe wants to come and make room in you. This morning as we, as we respond, we're going to sing this song, Infant Holy, Infant Lowly. And it says that the, the shepherds who were there on the hill ran and left everything because they saw the glory of Jesus Christ revealed. And now they are rejoicing. Let us be a people who rejoice in this. who lays his right hand upon us. And Father, we, may we know again this gospel of peace, this gospel of joy, this gospel that we can put our hope in, that Jesus Christ has come, that he has forgiven us, and that we are a people of the second birth, born again in him to life in Christ. Would you lead us in that this morning, we pray through him. Amen. I want to uh, just close by singing one more song, if we could, Richard. Can we sing one more song? Could we stand together and sing Mark the Herald Angels? This is a great song.
God bless you, church. Thank you for gathering here and those who have gathered online uh, to celebrate the good news uh, that a son has been born to us, a uh, son given, Jesus Christ our Lord. Just a couple uh, announcements for our congregation. Remember the cantata today at 3 o'clock outside. It's going to be awesome outside singing great songs of the season. And then next Sunday, we'll, we're actually going to have a congregational meeting after each of our three services be very brief to hear the report of the nominating committee. We can add names to the slate. We're not voting on a slate, but we can have opportunity to add names to the slate as a congregation. So that's next Sunday after each service. Again, thank you for being here and, and making much of our great, gracious God. And let's now receive his blessing. My brothers and sisters, may God bless you and keep you. The Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and grant you peace. He has in Jesus and he will forevermore. Glory be to God and peace be upon us. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Maybe some of those. Some of those. Ah, that's beautiful.